truth of these six mitzvahs is that there's six opportunities for intimacy at every single moment. We spoke about one of them already. We're on number two now. And over the next uh, couple months, we're going to be finishing up the whole series with the help of God. The first one is the intimate, constant awareness that God created the world, is involved in my life, and is guiding the world with a purpose. We call that all imuna. And imuna is not something that's just a plain, cold, intellectual truth, but something that's very warmly felt. You said that God created the world. Created. And that it has a... Purpose. Intimate connection with my life. Intimate connection with my life. So there's a creator. That's number one. Not that you know where we came from? The soup. The soup or better, you know, where'd you guys come from? Aliens. Okay, aliens. No, no, come on, you conspiracy theorist. Came from a stork, okay? Got dropped off, and that's that. Okay, moving on. That was the way that my, you know, ninth grade gym teacher explained things, more or less. Uh, and that was it. Okay, now back to kickball. He didn't speak very good English either. Um, anyways, so the constant mitzvah is that any time that a person starts abandoning that truth and feeling like life is random or that there's no purpose guiding things or he feels lost, he's moved away from that constant mitzvah. So, number one, it's seeing, this is all within the first mitzvah. Number one is knowing that God created the world and more intimately, which we'll talk about in the third mitzvah, is that God is still creating the world every single second. God is intimately involved in my life, which means nothing happens by chance. There's nothing random. It's not by chance that you're here. It's not by chance that, you're, that you're, you, your car got a flat. It's not by chance that you stubbed your toe. It's not by chance that that guy bullied you in the playground and punched you in the nose, you got a nosebleed, and you've had like, you know, problems with the, like your respiratory tract ever since, since that incident, and you just keep blaming that guy in the playground. None of it's by chance. It's all delineated, designed with purpose, according to the free will decisions that you've made in your life. And God is designing everything in your life to help you. Yeah? What does that mean that your life is also affected by others' free will decisions? Because if that guy had like the free will decision to punch you in the face and now your life is like constantly affected by it. So, nobody can lift a finger against you if God doesn't decree that it should happen. Nobody can lift a finger against you unless God decrees that it should happen. Nothing, not one thing. A hair doesn't fall out. A hair doesn't fall out unless God decrees that it should be. If it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. And how do you match that with free will? If it wasn't him, it would have been somebody else. He still has the ability to make that choice. No, no, it's no, coming I to that person. That. I mean, if, uh, if the God, everything happens to the God, allow it or guide it, so it will. He's saying the person making the decision. No, the two years, like he punched you, but like, did you have to get into the situation? There's two different then? questions on the table. One, that did the person have free will to punch me if it was coming to me? <clears throat> and so with that we answered, it was coming. It was coming, whether it was him, somebody else, it was all coming. That person is just a pawn. Yeah, I get it. Between him and God, he has his own free will, yes. You can't describe the free will discussion to God because God is outside of time. If I go into the future and I see what happens, that you're sitting here and you're just saying, should I just go and like check that buzz that just buzzed in my pocket or not? Or that's like disrespectful in the middle of learning Torah, or should I, shouldn't I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. 
And then, let's say I had a time machine, I go into the future, and I see what you decide. Do you have free will? Yeah. Yeah, why not? Because you don't know what you decided yet until you Yeah, decide. you're deciding now. When it, when God, though, is outside of time. He sees everything, but you're still deciding it. But doesn't God already know and have a plan for it? God sees, these are one of the secrets of creation. But you don't ever ascribe finite thinking onto God. God is infinite. There's no time and space. God is existence. The finite creation is able to make that decision. That's one of the greatest gifts that we have. The finite creation can make decisions and we can become the masters of our destiny because of that. Through our decisions. That's the power of our decisions. The power of God creating us with free will. That's all within the first mitzvah of Emunah. The second, which is the one that we're working on, is a don't do mitzvah. What's a don't do mitzvah? A prohibition. So, yeah, so I was waiting for a you know, prohibition, a negative commandment. It sounds so intense. What about a, a constant opportunity to mess up the intimacy with the one you love? Well, I wouldn't want to do that, right? A constant loisase means there's something that's always pulling me towards being unfaithful and that I'm on guard from that is a sign of loyalty to the relationship. I don't, I, I don't need to give such a wild analogy for people to understand. If somebody's married and wants to be faithful to his wife, so it might be quite a challenge if that person has uh, a phone in his pocket that has completely uh, images of women at all times on the phone. I mean, even regular things like just news that are not his wife that he can look at and watch and that he goes down the street and he sees women and he has uh, other women all over the place that are very nice to him. Maybe he's someone who's a, a wealthy person, so everyone's very nice to him. And, and of course, there's, you know, nice because there's not all the commitment that's involved. So he might have this constant challenge of saying, I don't want to get overly interested because I need to stay loyal to my wife. <coughs> that's where my loyalty lies, is in my faithfulness to my wife. So we have something like that with God. God says, I want you to be faithful to me. You know what you're always going to be lured after? trying to get what you need by going to all sorts of other sources to get what you need. What do we call that? Idol worship. Idol worship. Avay Zara, which we said is strange. It's strange worship. God says, I can give you the money you need. I can give you the, the, the intimacy, the relationship. I can give you everything that you need. The wealth, health. So why are you... Uh, kissing up to your boss, why are you being so overly that you believe in him? He's the one that holds the keys to your happiness, to your destiny. Why is your bank account? Why do they hold? Why when somebody comes in the room that you think is, you know, a powerful figure that controls your paycheck, that you get nervous? Why are you worshiping? Now, I don't mean that you're, you know, like, they walk in and you prostrate yourself and then you start like pouring wine libations in front of them on the floor and like oil libations and, and even though that, yeah, that, yeah, so a slaughter a girl on the spot, like offer the thing up to this person. I have an offering. For, even though there, there are spooky stuff that goes on like that nowadays still. There really is, sadly. But we're talking about a constant mitzvah. The constant mitzvah here is not that while you are walking to work, you're going to have this desire to slaughter an ox and present it to the bus driver of your Egged bus because you believe that all the fate of this trip, of him, the safe driving of the bus depends on him. So you better you know, bring some olive oil wherever you go and just offer stuff up to him. That wasn't 
even though that stuff goes on. But it was even subtly that when I get on the, when I get onto the plane, <coughs> here's one, when I get on the plane, now obviously you, we choose pilots that are responsible and that went through thousands of hours of pilot training. But who do I think about when I get on the plane that this should be a safe flight? Do I pray to the pilot? You pray that the pilot. I pray that God make this a safe flight. Guide the pilot's hands. <clears throat> Yeah. So basically, first of all, the boss example, like, let's say you want to raise, so, like, <coughs> if you go to him, you're, like, you're generally nice because, like, er, uh, like er, they're, they're her, it's like, just you don't be a polite, nice person, and then you ask him for a raise, and then, like, you don't, like, fawn over him, you don't, like, try to butter him up, you just, boss, I've been doing this work, you show him this, this, this reason I should get a raise, do you agree? And then you leave it up to God, basically, right? Yes, that's exactly it. You don't go and, and spend also over the amount of time, like, thinking that, like getting all nervous and not being able to sleep at night and I've got to go into the boss and I have to I spend a million hours drafting, redrafting the email that I'm going to send to him and I'm hinting to it. The first thing you do when you want to raise is talk to God. You talk to God and you look inside the Hashem's Torah where He tells you all the ways that you can get raises. You want to know one of the best ways? Tzedakah. to give charity. Rebetzin, um, Machlis, Aleya Shalom, the great Sadekis here from Yushalayim, the great, the, a, a woman that was the, an emulation of, of <coughs> God's qualities of kindness in this world. So she, all, she had, her husband is still Rav Machlis, Rabbi Willig's father in law, Zol Gazayant, he should be strong and well. They still have hundreds of people in their house for Shabbos, every Shabbos. And it's not like they live in a mansion. They live in a regular house in Malatafna. Just a little bit bigger than this room. Yeah, hundreds and hundreds of people. A modern-day Avram Avinu. A person, people of Chesed. So she would always say, and miracles were always happening in their house because she believed in Hashem so much. So she passed away a few years ago. And she would always say to people, she would say, you have $100 in your pocket and you give away 10. How much money do you have in your pocket? You have hundred dollars, you give away ten. So most people say ninety, right? Like, come on, what, like easy, you know, it's a basic arithmetic. They say, no, no, you got ten dollars in your pocket. What do you mean? I have hundred dollars, you gave away ten. How much do you have in your pocket? She would say ten. I said, no, it's ninety. No, she would say, you gave away ten. How much do you have in your pocket for eternity? That's all you have, because that money was mitzvah money. Now, if you spent the other 90 on, on Shabbos food and buying your wife, you know, new jewelry for Yom Tov and other mitzvahs and buying a silver Kiddush cup, you'll also take that money to heaven with you. But she was saying that the money that you give away to good things, that's money that's yours now forever, forever. Another way to make a lot of money, even in this world, is to make the blessing after you eat bread. We call that birkat hamazon. Benching. benching after eating. One of the most famous ways to become wealthy is to bench, <coughs> say for a chinuch, bench with kavon. And don't just rush through it. That's right. Kavon means, what am I saying? What am I saying? Also be careful, don't waste food. Don't waste crumbs. That's a big one. You cut your bread, you got crumbs on the table. Don't just like, whoop, yes, clean up the, you know. No, no. Do a little strategic, you know, grab the crumbs, they're called purim. Shefa. Shefa, pop them in. Every little crumb, because God says you're careful with even the crumbs. I see that you're responsible with the resources that I give you. You don't, you don't squander them, even down to the crumbs. Ooh, I'm going to pile it on for you. You want another, know another way to become rich? Honor your wife. That's right. Honor your wife. Be very, very nice to your wife. Another way to become rich? Say Parshas Amon, the chapter of the manna. What was the chapter of the manna? When the nation of Israel, the Hebrew here, when we were in the desert, after we came out of Mitzrayim, so there was a problem, because when you go into a desert, uh, there's no food. 
And that was one of the greatest praises that Klal Yisrael, that the Jews, when we left Egypt, the prophet describes us leaving Egypt as lechtech avas kluloi sayich, that the love of like a bride to her groom, lechtech acharai b'midbar be'eretz loy zarua, that you walked out into a desert landscape with, a, with, with no food, no nothing, trusting in the groom that he would go and find an oasis to take care of you, that us, the Jewish people, were that bride, and we went out without knowing where our next meal would come from. And of course, what happened? In the merit, Moshe Rabbeinu, bread started to come down from heaven. That was the mon. We ate bread from heaven. Could you imagine? Just look outside today. The forecast, bread falling from heaven. You know what bracha we made? Baruch ato Hashem, Eloikeinu melech ha'olam, ha'moitzi lechem min ha'shamayim, who brings bread from heaven. We ate bread that came from heaven. And you know how often the bread would fall? Once a day, and then double portion of bread. That's right, once a day. What do you mean? What are you going to have tomorrow? Don't worry about it. What, why is so what? <laughs> You're so worried. You don't think... God is raining bread and people try to, you know, stock up. Bread is raining down from heaven. Now, at that time, their amuna was so high that that was a part of our history that put into our DNA for eternity, all of us, that all of our wealth and livelihood comes from heaven. I have to get that straight. We get that straight. Not because of my amazing stock investments or lack of, or my great, you know, I forecasted, uh, whatever, um, your, your business acumen and, 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 and God. It all comes from God. You might have certain <laughs> skills, that's very nice, but where does it come from? And the same God that is giving me now is going to give me tomorrow, is going to give me tomorrow. The people, it's interesting, the people in the desert who had very little belief in God, do you know where their mun would fall? They would go out of their tent and they'd be looking like, I'm hungry, where's the mun? So they would go walking around like, where, you, know, you know, where's the cash at? Where's the cash money? Where's it, where's it at? Where's it at? You know? Was the, and they would have to travel, and finally they would find. They'd have to go quite far. They'd have to do a lot of work. <clears throat> They'd have to work a 70-hour week, you know what I'm saying? To make six figures or more, seven figures nowadays. They've they, they got to work a lot, you know what I'm saying? There were others who had more belief in God. They would come out of their tent, and they would just walk a little bit, and they would see, oh, beautiful packet of mun sandwiched between this translucent layer of, of dew on the top and dew on the bottom, shining, sparkling like a little packet of sweet honey bread, warm, freshly baked. Delicious, right? The people with even more belief in God, they would open their door and right on their doorstep, it was that easy. And the people with the greatest amount, <coughs> they would open their eyes, they would think of God, and the mun would fall into their mouth. So how much work do you have to do in this world to make money? Inversely proportional to your belief in God's abundance. The more that you know that God runs the world, you have to work less. The less you know that, you've got to work more. Everyone's got to work, by the way. Everyone's got to work. Except Rabbi Shimon. But Harba, yeah, that's right. You've got to open your mouth. Harba also could Rabbi Shimon, but also be yodel. Many people tried to do like Rabbi Shimon, but it didn't work. Do what, sir? Rabbi Shimon said, you don't have to work at all. Just learn Torah. Just learn Torah. Absolute amuna, and the, it'll come. By the way, when he meant learn Torah, he didn't mean like, hang out, get a nice coffee, 
you know, oh, what a long Seder, like, let's stretch our legs, you guys want to go sit in the city tonight, you know, third, you know, night Seder, okay, well, you know, what's one night off a week for nights, I, you know, I learned three, you know, Siddharma day, more or less. No, he meant you literally don't stop learning all day. Yeah, that's right. Like the Chazanish. Literally, you non-stop, like the stipler. The stipler would, had an interesting way that he would learn for 36 hours straight and then take like a, 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 a sleep. Reb Noach also did this. Reb Noach slept three hours a day, one hour at different times of the day. Would stand on his desk with his feet immersed in co- icy cold water to stay up. Did crazy things to just go and go and learn and learn and learn. But the Gemara testifies, many people tried to live this way. They felt like they're very holy, like Rabbi Shimon. It didn't work. Their rent came due. Their wife needed new clothing and shoes and lots of other good stuff that she deserves. It wasn't working out. The kids got, had holes in their, you know, in, their, in their pants and skirts. It wasn't going well. They tried to, but it didn't go. They weren't Rebbe Shimon. But yes, there is such a thing of the Rebbe Shimons of the world. But according to a person's awareness of God is the only truth, and that all the money comes from Him, more will flow in. We all have to do something. We have to put in a shtadlis. But don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget. We want to hide in your mouth. That's right. Don't ever forget. It's not according to how much work you put in is how much money you get. Very important. That's why, has anybody ever experienced that you were trying to, okay, you realize like the bank account is uh, getting low, better make a move. So you start making some move, and all of a sudden the money came in like in a different direction. Like you were, you're investing in, you know, this, your resume for this type of a field, the next thing you know, like you got an offer from something else. It comes in different ways, not proportionate to what you put in. So that moon is built by saying the portion on mun every day. Say the portion on mun every day, okay? How else do you become rich? <coughs> by benching after meals. Benching after meals? The tilas yodayim. I'm doing the shefa. That's right. How much, how much water should you use? As much as you can. Shefa, I believe says. Shefa. And then you put your hands like, what do you put hands like this? Put your hands like this? Like, like, the honey. like you're about to receive blessing from heaven. You know what I'm saying? You, you, you lift it up. You lift them up. Not above your head, by the way. It's, it's a whole thing. You lift it. The right one a little bit higher. Because chesed. Right? And you're lifting up, you're saying, Baruch ato Hashem elokeinu melech ha'oylam ha'moitzi lechem min ha'aretz. The ten fingers, the ten steps of the bread, all the shefa. Bread summarizes all of wealth and health. Wealth, wealth. Washing your hands properly. Cleanliness. Cleanliness is also very, very important. Because uh, the source of poverty, like places that are messy, right? That's right. Clean places have abundance. The base of Mikdash is... Clean, it's organized. The base of is called the Makam Ashiris. It's wealthy. The base of is made out of gold. Gold, Rabbi say. Gold, silver, beautiful, gorgeous. Gold. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's a place of wealth. The base of is organized, beautiful. Idol worship is saying that all the wealth, anything other than it's only from you, Hashem, is already now leaving the mitzvah. And therefore, there's a constant mitzvah to remind ourselves, anytime that I think that my hope comes from, bring it back to Hashem. Hashem, you're the only hope. And therefore, what did that Leah, she said to Obi-Wan? Obi-Wan, Kadobi. You're our only hope. Avoid Zara. It's not true. It's not true. She should have davened. And Leia is a Jewish name. She said, it's said, Hashem, you're my only hope. She is Oh, in real life, she's also Jewish? You're, you're the only hope, Hashem. Okay, Obi-Wan's a shaliach from you. We should be zarech to do this. Amen. Amen.